Good afternoon. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the philosophy department here at Providence College and the director of the Humanities Forum. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this week's forum. The Humanities Forum is an initiative of the Providence College Humanities Program. It's a regular space most Friday afternoons during the semester when the campus community come together to reflect on some of the uh, central themes in the humanities. One, at least once a semester, we host a musical performance and discussion, and it's really our honor and pleasure this week to welcome the Bohemian Quartet to Providence College's campus. Musical performances for the forum are also always joined to a discussion of the cultural context of the music, and I'm pleased now to introduce Professor Jennifer Luzzi, an associate professor of history here at Providence College who is our co-host this afternoon with Professor Stan Renard and the Bohemian Quartet. Having received her PhD in history from the University of Minnesota in 2008, Dr. Lucy has been a member of the history department here since 2011. She teaches regularly in the DWC program as well as courses in modern European history and global feminism. A devoted member of the Providence College community, she was the inaugural recipient of the Providence College Faculty Service Award for exceptional service to PC in 2017. She's a specialist in the Romani, also known as the Roma or Gypsies. Her book, Gypsies in Germany and Italy, 1861 to 1914, Lives Outside the Law, was published in 2014. And she's lectured widely on this topic, including an appearance on NPR's All Things Considered. And I might add, I just learned she's working at the moment on the relationship between the Romani and uh, the Catholic Church in Italy. We are delighted to have her with us for today's forum. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Jennifer Luzzi. Welcome. Um, so I titled my talk today, the, the Romani people, a people of Europe and their stories. And I borrow this, a people of Europe from, oh, I was going to set my timer so I don't talk too long. <laughs> um, because I take the term from Sir Angus Fraser, who wrote a history called the Gypsies, uh, which is a very good history. But one of the things I like most about the book is that the main argument is that the Romani are a people of Europe. They're not often thought about that way, and they're not often considered to be, but they are, in fact, a people of Europe, an, eth an ethnic group that has been in Europe for a very long time. So who are the Romani people? As I said, it's an ethnic group. Um, they arrived in Europe somewhere around the late Middle Ages uh, to the early Renaissance period, and they remain, of course, a people of Europe today. Um, I have uh, here on the slide a sketch. This sketch was done by uh, Leonardo da Vinci in 1493, and it's entitled Man Tricked by Gypsies. And this gives you a sense of a long-standing prejudice and history of persecution of the Romani people upon their arrival, really soon after their arrival uh, in Europe. And so you see here the fine, upstanding Roman citizen surrounded by gypsies who are bilking him out of his, his money or some, doing some sort of trick uh, against him. And so one of the things that I have found most striking in my research is there's such a divide between perceptions of who gypsies are and the actual lived experience of the Roman people. And personally, in my own work, um, you know, when I was defending my dissertation, I had one member of the committee come uh, into my dissertation defense and tell me how Gypsy stole his wallet uh, while he was in Italy, which is kind of unwelcome. He had just read my book. I'm like, really? Um, <laughs> and then, uh, but this really differs from the experience I've had with Romani people in my life. Uh, people I've met, women's studies professors, musicologists, musicians, sanitation workers, linguists, anthropologists, right? So Romani people are a very diverse uh, group, and uh, they, there is a huge gap between the perception and the lived reality. The Romani people are a diaspora people. Um, and diaspora people have, you know, there's advantages and disadvantages to being diasporic. Um, it's difficult to maintain cultural traditions in a diasporic community, and as you can see from this map, the Romani people are located in every country in Europe. The larger wagon wheels mean more people. The wagon wheel, by the way, is on the 
Romani flag. Um, it is a symbol of the people of the ethnic group. So that's why it's used here to depict the numbers of Romani throughout Europe. But the advantage of the diasporic people is they have this rich and diverse fabric of their cultural life, and we'll look at one aspect of that today. The Romani people are divided into several large subgroups. One of them is Sinti. Uh, those are mainly located in northern Italy, also in Germany. The Manouche, who are located in France. Uh, the Rom people that are in Central and Eastern Europe, and the Kale, which are also Central and Eastern European. And even within those major subgroups, there are smaller groups that are divided by professions, historical professions, horse traders, or basket makers, or um, steel or, or metal workers. Um, so there's a lot of different groups of, under this one umbrella of Romani. So the Romani people, as I already alluded to, have a difficult story and a difficult history. I took this photograph in Rome, Italy, uh, in 2008, um, and it says, no gypsies, no Rome camps. Um, and that continues even today, that kind of prejudice. Uh, just when I was doing research this summer in Italy, um, there was two cases in the news, one of a Romani girl who was shot by a white nationalist. Um, and another case of a camping ground in which many Romani families had lived for several, I think it was 20 years, and the, the government came in and shut it down with no warning, and even against the European uh, Court of Human Rights who had ordered a stay on the closure of the camp. Uh, it was closed anyway, and people were left on the street with no alternate plan for housing. So this is a difficult story and a difficult history. So I have a short amount of time. So <laughs> I'm only gonna give you a little teeny bit of that history, and I'm gonna span the 20th century with the story of one large family of Rome horse traders who um, have their origins in the Italian borderland of Friuli, which is a place in Italy that uh, rotated between Austrian rule and Italian rule. It becomes Italian after the First World War, um, and so this family kind of moved in between Austrian and Italian citizenship and state borders. But it's the highlighted area on this map up here. Sorry, it's not very clear. Um, so the Lavakovich family. Um, so the four of them uh, that are the focus, I found this file in, in the Rome archive, and the Rome authorities, they start collecting data on this family in 1908. Um, this is Maria, Ursula, Leopoldo, and Michele. These are their mugshots, so they were not having their best day, obviously, <laughs> from their mugshots, but these photographs were included in the file. Um, and so they were mostly horse traders, and again, from Friuli. Um, and there's another Lavakovich I'm going to include in this story, whose name is Giuseppe Lavakovich. He published an autobiography bio in 1976. Um, and I'm going to tell part of his story. The relationship between the groups is not quite known, but again, they're from the same region, they practice the same profession. Chances are there was some relationship between these families. Um, so on March 29th, 1908, in the province of Treviso, the police arrested members of this family, including these four you see here. They were arrested for measures of public security because they were without means of sustenance. This is a rather arbitrary law that was often used to persecute unwanted groups, right? So if you were walking around with no money in your pockets, you would probably only be arrested for that crime if someone suspected that you might be a gypsy. Michele was described as having brown skin, and under his profession, he was listed as a gypsy, a zingaro. And his marital status was listed as living with uh, Lavakovich Maria. When he was asked of his origins, Michele stated, I cannot say anything about the location of my origins. I do not remember knowing my parents, who have been dead for many years, and I do not know where they died. I know that my father's name was Giovanni. I do not know my mother's name. I believe that I was born in Italy, and more precisely in the Veneto, but I cannot say precisely in which town or province, since I am not registered in any civil registry. I was always told that I had come into the world on the road with others, under the trees, as generally all the gypsies do. However, I cannot exclude that I was born abroad. 
On my account, I can declare that I have never been abroad and that I have always remained in the Veneto, traveling around the provinces of Vicenza, Udine, Bel Belluno, and especially in the mountains of Cadore in Bellinzona. I live in marriage with the Gypsy Maria Lovakovich, and I do not remember where I met her. From our, uh, from our union, five children were born here and there, but always in the Veneto, and they were not registered in any civil registry. So, of course, you can see here a narrative of resistance of Mikhail Lovakovich in 1908. Um, he clearly does not want the, the person who is interrogating him to know where he came from or who he is. Uh, and this is a strategy used by Romani families early in the 20th century um, because right, they're trying to navigate, right, to prevent himself from getting expelled to Austria-Hungary. Um, the interrogator responded to Michele, Michele by saying, your pronunciation has nothing to do with the Italian language or with the Venetian dialect, and he must be Austro-Hungarian, so he should have to leave. The police detained the family in Conegliano for a month um, and proposed their expulsion as foreigners. They need this month uh, to do research on the background of the family in order to determine if they can send them back to Austria-Hungary. At the end of the month, there's a letter in the file from uh, Michele asking the police to please bring his children to the jail because they can no longer live outside by themselves. So for this whole time, they're living without their parents who are both in jail. It's unclear if they were being taken care of by a neighbor or a friend, um, but the, the children became unable to support themselves. So the family's geographical origins posed a tricky problem for Italian authorities since they were known in the region and by locals, but had no documents and didn't register their births. So this offered some kind of protection for them because it became very difficult to expel them through official channels back to Austria. But it also placed the family in this category of stateless people. This illustrated the difficulty of the Romani people themselves at this time. They often refused to identify themselves to make it difficult for the police but that often allowed authorities to strip them of any claims to nationality, which left them outside of the protections of the law. So as I mentioned before, Giuseppe Lovakovich also grew up, uh, was born early in the 20th century, like Michele, who we just heard from, and he published an autobiography in 1976. So this is a little excerpt from that biography of his life, and again, I want you to focus here on the difference between his lived experience and the police persecution story that we, we just heard. Um, so he's writing about his childhood. My father carried the tents on his shoulders, and my mother carried pots and pans for cooking, and I, who was a small child, had to take care of the guard dog, because in those places, there were many wolves. Around sunset, my father would stop in a good spot for camping, a little elevated, so that there wouldn't be a danger of flooding, protected from the wind, and not far from a water source, and always close to a village, so that we could buy food. My father or my mother, according to the circumstances, put up the tents, assisted by the children. The fire was lit with wood we found in the area, and we prepared to eat. We ate dinner at sunset. When we had these little parties, he's talking about fest festivities, um, my father would invite his friends, either Rome or Gaji, and Gaji is the Romani term for non-Romani people. Um, either Rome or Gaji, and everyone ate sitting on the ground around the fire. Sometimes someone brought an instrument, a harmonica, or a guitar, and then we sang in the Romani language or the language of the Gaji. The next morning at dawn, we departed. My father was very much liked by the Gaji and by the authorities because he was an honest person and a hard worker. My family did not speak Italian, but our, our language, and the three languages of those locales, Croatian, Croatian, Slovene, and Serb. My sister helped her mother with the chores and with preparing food. When we arrived at the new workplace at the end of our travels, generally close to a sawmill, my father rented a stall or a lean-to from the local farmers, because in those places it might snow up to a meter, and one just couldn't stay in a tent. My father worked driving carts or sleds with a pair of horses, to transport the trunks of trees. He was a very prized worker because he understood the horses. It wasn't enough to own them, but instead to really understand them. 
In fact, the Rome have always had this special ability and a love for horses, and for this reason, they tend to get along very well. So you see here a tension between police persecution of a Lovakovich family that is prosperous and does have um, experience and money from trading in horses, and the story of Giuseppe's childhood, uh, which is relatively kind of a nice, a nice story of childhood. Um, and it also points to another interesting difference that I've been thinking a lot about, that many of these Romani families had relationships with local farmers. And they came to the same farmers every year, and they got hay, and they got wood in return for labor, and they would form friendships. And this is very different from the relationship that they had with the local authorities and with the police. And so there's really a tension there. So this relatively idyllic picture changes, particularly in Italy, uh, by 1910. There's a cholera outbreak in Italy in 1910. It's focused um, in the south of Italy, near Bari. Um, and it is linked to the arrival of a group of gypsies, supposedly. Of course, we know now that cholera is not spread that way. It's not person-to-person -person contact. It's bad sanitation. Um, but at the time, it was blamed on the arrival of the gypsies. So you see here that chart was in the archive, and it sort of says the date of the arrival of the, of the, um, the gypsies and then the spike in the number of cholera cases. Therefore, it must be the gypsies. Um, that's the headline from the Stampa uh, about the, the cholera epidemic. So at the time of this cholera epidemic, the Italian state decides, rather than just sort of informal persecution of gypsy families, they're going to expel them all from Italy. So the Lovakoviches in their previous arrests had been arrested, uh, detained, as we saw with the Lovakoviches, and eventually released, usually, because they couldn't prove their citizenship and they usually couldn't prove the crime they had arrested them on. So they were usually just released eventually, went back, did their thing. Um, but in 1910, that changes. In 1910, they're expelled. Um, so two years um, after, after the 1908 incident I told, told you about, um, in 1910, Leopoldo and Michele were arrested in Treviso in the Veneto. Um, and they were scheduled for expulsion. Um, and so the gypsies were supposed to make their own way over the Austrian border at this point. Um, and so what ends up happening, basically, because I don't want to take too much time, is the family gets arrested, they're expelled to Austria, there's a problem, because they get to Austria, and they have to board a steamship to cross, uh, cross the, uh, the lake and the steamships are no longer letting people they label as gypsies on. Because what's been happening is the people get on, Austria says they're not getting off here. They come back to Italy, and Italy says they're not getting off here. And they end up with people living on a steamship. So the steamship companies are like, we're not taking people that we think are gypsies anymore. So the Italian state and the Austrians keep shoving the people back that the Italians are trying to send back over this border back and forth. So the Italian government comes up with a solution which is to send people to Brazil which has very open immigration policies, and so they stick them on a boat from Genoa, and they're shipped off to Brazil. So the Lovakoviches are sent to Brazil twice, and both times, they come right back to Italy. Now, that's not uncommon, because there was a whole group of Italian workers called Golandrinas, uh, like, uh, named after birds, basically, who would go and work in Argentina and then come back, so seasonal workers. Um, but the Lovakoviches kept coming back. Their home was in Italy. That's where their business was. So they kept coming back. By 1912, um, Michele is again arrested. Um, and he is arrested for aggravated begging. He's destitute, and he's begging. So what had been a relatively prosperous family of horse traders, by 1912, they don't have anything anymore in the family because they've spent all their money going back and forth to Brazil, which is not something they really intended to do. Um, and so Michele um, claims that he's an Austrian resident, and they send him back to Austria once again. Um, at this point, so Michele had previously fought hard to sort of say, I'm an Italian citizen, but at this point he just says, I'm Austrian, he's destitute, and he goes back. 
Um, World War I brought further difficulties for the Lovakovich family. Their travel routes were limited because of the border controls during the war. There was a brief easing of these problems after World War I, but then, of course, um, there's the rise of fascism in both Italy and Germany, which leads to more problems for the Lovakoviches. Um, interestingly, Giuseppe Lovakovich, whose story I read a little bit from, he actually volunteers to go build railroads for Mussolini in, in Abyssinia, Ethiopia. He does so successfully, uh, and he gains his Italian citizenship by doing this, and he comes back an Italian citizen. Meanwhile, his family was interned in uh, Mussolini's internment camps for uh, Roma and Sinti. And many people died in those camps. Several members of his family died. They did not get their Italian citizenship. So it was kind of, he comes back to this like shock of what had happened to his family. Um, so this is another piece of the story from an Alberto Lovakovich. And this was published in 1972. Um, and he tells his story of being deported um, during World War II. I was a small child of three in 1943 in Dachau in Germany. I was in that extermination camp at a very tender age, and I saw hundreds of human beings die, most of them Sinti and Jews. They died of hunger, and that little bit of black bread that they gave us was given with evil intent. And I saw my sister tossed heartlessly onto a wagon and thrown in the crematorium on the orders of the Führer, in front of our eyes and those of our dear mother, who tried to hold her back, but they ripped her away and only her hair remained in her hand. And I have a, um, a painting here done by Chaya Stoika, who was an a Austrian Romani um, Holocaust survivor. And she died in 2013. Um, and when she was in her 50s, she began doing these paintings to sort of document her memories of Auschwitz all those years later. So under um, the fascist regime in Italy, and of course under the Nazis in Germany, many Roman people were interned and killed during the war, including members of the Lovakovich family. So to sum it all up, the Lovakoviches, I think, tell, and I know it's a geographically limited story, but they tell a little piece of some of the 20th century history of the Romani people. And for me, they tell a story of resilience, of flexibility, and of survival in the face of a culture and a society that often has the aim of getting rid of them. Um, and so it's quite a remarkable story of this family. I think it also gives a sense of the idea that I started with, that Romanis are a people of Europe. They belong there as much as anyone else, despite the popular perception that they don't. Um, and there's also a bit of a story here of maintaining cultural distinctiveness through art, poetry, music, language, and dress. And we're going to hear a little bit more of that happier story <laughs> um, from my, my co-host today, uh, Stan Renard and the Bohemian Quartet. Um, and so, yeah, it'll get happier now. <laughs> hopefully. Um, so we're very lucky today to have with us the Bohemian Quartet, the acclaimed Providence, Rhode Island uh, based in ensemble featuring a violin, a viola, cello, and bass, specializes in the music of the Romani or Gypsy tradition, along with related Eastern European folk styles. The Bohemian Quartet was founded in 2005 violinist Stan Renard, a composer and virtuoso player, assembled the group with the idea of preserving the tradition and indulging in the virtuosic playing of classic gypsy music. Renard recruited like-minded friends, David Zinno on upright bass, Christine Harrington on cello, and Nancy Richardson on viola. I had the pleasure of taking in a performance of the quartet last spring when they performed with the Bristol Community S String Project, which Stan had a hand in forming while he was here in Rhode Island. Um, Stan is going to give you a little bit of the history behind Romani music tradition, um, and he studied violin performance in Moscow, London, and Boston. He's also an alumnus of the Pierre Monteau Conducting School in Hancock, Maine. As a conductor, Stan studied with and was the assistant of maestros Lanfranco Marcelletti, sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, Harvey Solberger, and Michael Jinbo. Stan Renard holds a master in music from the Conservatory of Versailles, France, in chamber music a master in music from UMass Amherst in violin and viola performance, an MBA from right here, 
go Friars, Providence College, and uh, a PhD in international business from Southern New Hampshire University, and a DMA in violin performance from the University of Connecticut. Dr. Renard served as the conductor of the Colby Symphony Orchestra and the Violin Viola Applied Music Associate at Colby College. Currently, Dr. Renard is Assistant Professor of Music Marketing at the University of Texas in San Antonio, Texas. So I am, so, oh, before I say that, I'm sorry. If anyone has questions for me, I can take one or two now, or we can just hold off and wait until the reception. Um, but otherwise, we were planning on having Stan talk to you a little bit and, and play some music. But if anyone has a quick question or two, I'd be happy to answer. Yes? Many groups of the students determine discrimination and oppression tend to succumb to the lure of secular market culture. Uh, how would you do that? I think, in many ways, there is a, a concerted effort to maintain Romani values and Romani culture in the face of, of losing that identity. But I think like in any community, it's a struggle between those who are integrated, right, and who are professors of music, professor of whatever, right, that, that there's always a pressure for all of us to sort of conform. Um, but I think there is a, a very concerted nationalist movement that's emerged, since, especially since the 1970s, among the Romani people to kind of maintain a cultural identity and a cultural distinctiveness. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's certainly a lot of debate about that, but we know that the Romani people original, originated in India um, and began migrating northward and westward, really starting around, mm, best estimates, 900 to 1,000 um, AD. Um, see, I guess what and the, we know this because their language is, is, is Indic, right? We know that the, the, the language roots are from India. Uh, but there's different theories about which group migrated out of India and which caste they were related to. There's a whole debate about that. Okay, so I'm so excited to introduce Stan, uh, Dr. Renard, sorry, Dr. Renard and the Bohemian Quartet to you today. And please join me in thanking them immensely for being here. Oh, can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> you come with music. <laughs> All right, great, awesome, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, uh, Megan, so much for inviting uh, us to uh, be part of this forum. It's very special. Uh, we're going to be uh, a student here in uh, 2005, 2006. So the college has changed when it was at six. It's exciting. You know, so lots of good things is happening. Um, I run this uh, group which I started in 2005, the Bohemian Quartet, and it, it had different instruments over the years. And this is like the current ensemble that we've been playing together since about, oh, I don't know, like maybe 2009 or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, in my experience with this music, I, mean, I grew up in southern France. And um, my father is, is, is Parisian from France, and my mother is Polish from um, what used to be uh, Poland, but now it's Ukraine, Lviv, that's the very second world war, you know, Poland, but most of Poland, you know, most of Ukraine is Poland. Poland was the largest country, but after the second world war, Uh, but anyway, let me start a little bit about what is Romani music. Uh, 
uh, it's more music, you know, different genres and so forth. Uh, and let's get started here real quick. Okay, and, and the, I think I'm going to start with one particular question that I get all the time. Uh, folks tell me, uh, <coughs> mentioned uh, the term where GT, the term GT comes from. Um, it's a misconception by the Europeans who thought that the GT were Egyptians. who came from Egypt, but GT, they didn't understand. So they, uh, we don't use the term GT because of the, uh, well, I'm excited to use it because of the uh, negative connotations that it carries besides uh, that's, this is the term that we use. There is no written language for Romanos. There's no such thing as a written language. They have, you know, we can agree on the on the, on the, uh, on the spells of words. They're speaking different dialects. They don't understand each other. And uh, so it's, it's a very uh, a rich tradition. But it's, very, uh, it's an oral tradition. Music is not oral. Uh, it, it's, it's been taught orally all over the world until maybe like in you know, the, 19th, the late 19th century, early 20th century. But before that, everyone learned music by ear. And, you know, it's, it's what's very common. I wrote the music down, just because we have tons of it. So, I uh, will share that with you. But anyway, um, the Klesmer musicians, the Klesmerians, and the Romani have um, uh, a common origin. Uh, they play very similar tunes, usually sirvas, choras, uh, doing us, uh, so that's the type of dances. We always dance to for celebration. We have a function in society. Every single piece has a function in society. It's not just one thing. We are not any for celebrating weddings, for funerals, or for a lot of lives to be sure of the city and so forth. But anyway, uh, it's, okay. So this is a flat number two. C-L-A-J-A-N-I and 99% of people 
people who live in that village are professional musicians. <laughs> and mostly what do they do? They play weddings. That's what they do. Everybody's a girl. And that's a particular uh, uh, a short video about her. That's that village. Uh, among my very well known uh, Romani uh, creative people, Charlie Chaplin was a woman. Uh, George Schiffer, the classical pianist, very famous, was a woman. Uh, and it's a, it's a very long list. Uh, anyway, okay. So the, the origin of the Romani people go back to the Punjab region of India, which is what we know today as Rajasthan. And so the first tune that we're going to play today for you, I figured you know usually everything is something very different here. Yeah, I do the whole part of the play, but I decided to do things and kind of follow the, the diffusion of the diaspora and play the tunes as they are aligned with the different. Countries and uh, you know, the, what we call the uh, Roman control, the gypsy. Okay, so this is a tune that's it's called uh, Kayan Raga. And the Raga is, um, is, is very, in some sense, it an improvised melody. And uh, this is what we're going to play for you. This is a tune that I got from uh, a fellow who played the Hamilton singer in India. And so it's a Roman musician from uh, the Punjab region. And uh, the, the name of that particular Ahamadis uh, is the Santu. And so I tried to create an arrangement for this group, even though we play old string instrument, to imitate a percussive instrument playing this right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Could be done with a piece, right? What is it? Two and three. Or is it seven?
It has a Romanian fortune, but you know, the Turks invaded Europe for a very long time and all the way to Vienna. And this is like the heritage of the God with them. So this is very much a Turkish even though it was performed in uh, in, in a Romanian folk, a Romanian folk arrived for a very long time. So we're just done to play the jump right now.
this, around the same time when this music was appearing, uh, there was a band by the emperor there that he was uh, eagle for classical musicians, the one that he was going to employ in these courts to play basses and, uh, you know, play all sorts of like fancy, uh, you know, uh, gigs, you know, that he did then. Um, and so what happened, he put the decree on, um, you know, trees and different like pubs and so forth, chocolate, and, uh, you know, but the Romans kept playing the full repertoire, so the classical musicians were not allowed to play folk music, right? They could not play fiddle tunes, that's what it is. Fiddle tunes. No classical musician was allowed. And they were different, so they could read the decree. Roman musicians could not. So they ignored it. And, uh, of course, they did not play the court, they played in the church, in the taverns, in the bars. And they maintained this repertoire, thanks to them, this still exists. Otherwise, none of this folk music in the country, you know, it will still would exist, because it was all already transmitted. So one generation of musicians stops playing it, it is gone. Right? Uh, remember, the first ethnomusicologists that were, you know, recording folk music, was Bartok and Kodak, who, who, who were two, uh, you know, the guy in the media, you know, uh, ethnic musicologists. He didn't suddenly this until like the 1930s. So, you know, music for like 300 years before that would have disappeared in the Rome, we're not there to have preserved it in some kind of way. But, at the same time, I need to mention this, just like when you say a joke, and someone tells you a joke, and you tell someone else that same joke, you're going to say it differently, you're going to change it. The day of grace might be a little bit different. It was the same thing with the music. So what started as very, um, perhaps, I don't want to use the word plain, but plain folk music became very elaborate, with lots of ornaments and speeds and all sorts of virtuous things to, you know, to take people who were dreaming a little too much. Okay? I uh, hope that makes some sense at all. So um, we're going to like, uh, play a tune called Tribal dance.
Move us along a little bit here. And, uh, oh, okay, let me pause this for a second. So, as I mentioned, 50 different dialects, is there a common music? A common music? Well, perhaps not using the language, maybe like, you know, part of the language, because then it would be 50 different languages. It doesn't really work very well to do songs.
you know, uh, let's say, cleanful music, but he used, the composer certainly used these parts of the world to come up with melodies that sounded less than that. Okay? But it's very different from hearing something like this. So, oh yeah, so a couple of uh, other clues. Oh, sorry. So in classical music, we typically use like 2, 4, 3, 4, 2, 4, 3, 4, 4, 4, uh, typical meters. In Romani music, we use like a lot of these um, mix meters and compound meters that are very different as ratios of numbers. Uh, and then the performance practice is what is heard about um, but not seen. So, for instance, what I write on the page here and what I play is not the same. I add a lot of things, I subtract things. Every time I play, I do a completely new number of truths. Like if I say the same joke twice, I'm not going to say exactly the same. You might make me laugh one time, and the other time, I find that every time that be just quite this. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, that's, that's what performance practice means. And in, 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 an example of what performance practice in, in Romanian music will be like effects such as um, like this kind of whistling sound or left hand fits. Things like that that you sometimes do to add you know, effects and so forth. And the, the tune that we're going to play next has plenty of those. Um, I think what is essential for me is the function of music. A lot of the time we forget that music, you know, especially folk music, had a function in society. Uh, so if you think about, you know, perhaps the roots of jazz, you have, you know, uh, you know, you can get it in the south and then you build a river in order to like, maintain a work habit. It, it was very much the same thing in, 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 in different aspects of, uh, you know, folks who sang songs in order to, to work. So folks who sang songs or uh, played music for weddings, funerals, uh, and, and so on. Okay? So it had a function. We bring soldiers to the army. So all sorts of roles in society. It was not just one thing. And I think that's my point here. Um, lots of variable techniques in this style of music. Uh, it's very unlike classical music, where the tempo is set and you play through the tune in one particular speed, unless it's a different movement. But in, in this case, we rush all the time. And rushing is part of that performance practice that we're talking about. In terms of learning this music, you know, some folks have to break it. The experience I had was a multi-generational experience. It started with the families, and usually it's not taught outside of the families, right? Because it's no tradition, it's kept secret in some way. But because, um, uh, you know, a lot of this tradition is staying now, uh, there's very sort of the of uh, ways of learning. But it's a multi-generational, um, you know, learning technique. You learn from the older, more, uh, advanced and more experienced musician. So usually the eldest in the group is known as the lauta. And lauta in Romanian means the root. Because back then, you know, the root player played was in the of the But nowadays, lauta means this. Okay, the tradition the name that means basically led from the lauta, you know. Uh, very similar to what was done with cantatas with Bach in church and then the violin and the was the orchestra that was before conductors in And so it can be like that, but more on the full level. So I guess that's what I have. Yeah, the, you know, so these are all the genres of music that somehow, you know, are connected to Romani musicians and Romani music. So, you know, with this in mind, we're going to play a match music for a by uh, Diku. Diku, Grigorash Diku, um, you can find recordings of him. He, uh, he passed away, I think, in the 50s, and he recorded a couple of very beautiful recordings. Um, the, the American violinist, classical violinist, Yasha Eifert, what he was a very violinist here from it. So, uh, Grigorash Diku uh, wrote a lot of music, again, 
in here, but a lot of it is, is preserved thanks to you know recording technology because he lived in the first part of the 20th century and that was it. So there we go. So this is a fora very much like what the let's marine fora is like in um, in Israel, but this one is a Romanian Romano. Fell out of favor. You know, the guitar was invented at that time, so the guitar took over the, the 